I think it's uh, wonderful that we beget, we were able to open with the Subak and now we're able to close with the Subak because everybody just loves the story about the Subak. And it's a wonderful story about an ancient system in a, a really beautiful part of the world. Um, as was mentioned, I'm a landscape architect and an assistant professor and I also have a design studio in New York City called Studio Read and I, my interest in in re my research is uh, sacred landscapes and I look at the ecological adaptations of indigenous and traditional peoples and think about how in contemporary landscape architecture we can bring those ideas and inform us about sustainability and about how we deal with these uh, our emerging ecological environments in our cities and in, in our rural landscapes as well. Um, so uh, I'm really happy that I got to speak today. Um, because I had time to recover my voice. And if I do begin to whisper, it's not because I'm talking about sacred landscapes, it's just because I have had a touch of the laryngitis. So just bear with me over the next 30 minutes. Uh, a lot of people ask me how Steve and I met. And it was actually through the US ambassador uh, for Indonesia, his wife, who introduced us when I won a grant about a year ago to study the Subak uh, landscape. And since then, Steve and I have been working on a landscape conservation and livelihood development strategy to assist the farmers in the Subak uh, to control their cultural landscape now that there's this influx of tourism uh, going into the UNESCO World Heritage Site. But I'll go back to my research and then I'll end with the Subak system. So landscape architecture without landscape architects comes from a term that looks at the idea that indigenous peoples are actually uh, uh, adapting their environments and designing their environments intrinsically and uh, far more symbiotically than we're designing our environments now. So we can actually learn from these um, ecosystem dwellers about landscape architecture, about the profession uh, that I specialize in. And so this lecture is actually going to be uh, divided into three different sections. Um, looking at this new conservation, mo conservation model, which is why I'm actually studying traditional and indigenous peoples' uh, ecological environments. Looking at this idea of coupled human nature systems, which is a type of systems that ecosystems dwell dwellers actually develop with their environments. And then looking at migrating these innovations that uh, the ecosystem dwellers are developing into contemporary design and into the cultural landscapes of the Subak. So just to give some context as to why we're looking at this and why we're revisiting conservation is because we're, we're known to be existing right now within a period of time which is the sixth great extinction. And um, it's the fastest extinction that we have been known to experience in the history of the Earth. Um, so it's almost 20 years has passed since Richard Leakey published his controversial claims on conservation and species loss disproving Darwin's belief that extinction only happens slowly. What we have been doing in uh, conservation, the realm of conservation, for um, the last 150, 200 years since 1864, is we've been looking at this protected area movement and applying it all over the world. And this model began a long time ago in Yosemite National Park, and it really hasn't developed uh, that much. What we have seen, though, is that the model isn't that effective. In the last... Um, especially in the last 30 years, we've seen that the number of uh, conservation areas, the number of sites that we're protecting around the world is rising, and it's rising quite significantly. But at the same time, so is species extinction. So there's a relationship between, um, there isn't a relationship between the amount of protection and conservation and the protection of species and um, biodiversity throughout the world. The other flip side of that is that all these conservation areas around the world that we're actually um, protecting has is led to a new uh, group of refugees. They're called conservation refugees. And in Africa alone, there's an estimated 14 million conservation refugees. Once a national park or a protected area is designated, often the people who've lived there for a very long time are asked to leave that area in the name of conservation to protect the biodiversity which actually exists in that area. What happens as well when these people are asked, uh, forcibly removed from the areas, um, they're displaced, but it also leads to a loss of accumulated ecological knowledge, which is what, is what I'm actually interested in, and the management techniques of these ecosystem and biospheres. 
However, there is an alternative to this conservation um, movement, which is global and sort of quite pervasive at, at the moment, and that's the global network of sacred sites. These exist within what is called the Shadow Conservation, ne conservation Network. <coughs> and sometimes these sacred sites do exist within national parks, but they can exist outside of them as well. And it's just the sacred areas that exist around the world that are deemed as sacred by all the different nationalities and populations, religions, um, often indigenous and traditional peoples that exist. And often that type of protection is actually um, uh, far more effective than uh, the traditional, the global protected area movement, our legislative protection. So what we've come to see is that indigeneity actually is protecting biodiversity and this came out and has been proven in mappings that happened after the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. When people started to put maps up and look at where are the biodiversity hotspots in the world and where are indigenous people living and they started to realise that they were coinciding. They started to put the puzzle together and think, okay, there's something happening there. And uh, so that there's this sacred relationship between the landscape, the places where Indigenous people are living, and biodiversity protection. And uh, what I've been looking at is this idea that they, the, the Indigenous people are living in these very complex environments. They maintain them, they're understanding them, and they're living in them very sustainably through an accumulated body of knowledge, practices, and beliefs that has been evolving over a very, very long period of time. And that we can actually learn from the ways that people are living in these environments. And we've already started to do that. It's actually not um, you know, a completely revolutionary idea. We Designers have been uh, applying indigenous innovation um, for a long time, and we're actually quite advanced in things like uh, green roof technology, which came from technologies. Uh, this is an image of the Vikings and Viking houses. Um, but one thing happened when we started to look at innovation. We started to look at a very, very few cultures in the Enlightenment period. We started to look at a very small number of cultures, and the idea of innovation became very narrow. So what we're trying to do is actually broaden this notion of innovation and start to look at the many different cultures that still exist for a while, perhaps, <coughs> around the world, and look, at, look to them to see what innovative practices could be developed for, for our contemporary design today. The person that actually sort of first identified this was this man, Bernard Radofsky, in his book, Ar Architecture Without Architects, in 1965. It hasn't developed that much um, since that period, and it hasn't developed really at all in the realm of landscape architecture, so that's what we're actually um, looking to progress. And what he was saying is that architects have overlooked the vernacular and the breadth of innovation that, is in, that in isolation has pretty much completely remained unexplored. And at, at this vast scale, we really don't have any idea about how to apply this type of innovation. Although innovation this is actually an image in the Philippines of a system of rice terrace. It exists all throughout that area. So. One of the fundamental ideas is that um, human beings um, are disassociated from their natural environments. Um, but we're looking at sort of ecosystem dwellers, and we see that they're not particularly uh, in discordant from the natural environments. Well, we have to understand that human beings and non-human species, we all cause ecological disturbance. And that's what um, all th these interventions are, whether it's a city whether it's a small village or whether it's a migrating herd of wildebeest. We're causing ecological disturbances and environments uh, respond to that. This um, species, he actually governs a particular ecosystem. This is a shot from Kruger National Park with the savanna. And he is the um, <coughs> species which maintains the huge grasslands. He's called the keystone species of that environment and he maintains that ecosystem. So what he the way that he does that, um, every single night in the nighttime foraging parade, the elephants will actually go through and knock over trees to get at the really fresh, succulent material at the top of the trees. This, they maintain the ecosystem constantly. If they were to, to be removed from that environment, it would turn into an acacia forest. Uh, this is uh, the devastation that is caused by the elephants as uh, they walk through these environments. And this is what they're maintaining. 
They're maintaining a grassland ecosystem that actually provides food and habitat for many other different herb herbivore species. But he's not the only person who does that. We've learned from observation about how to maintain our environments and our ecosystems, and we do this by pyrotechnology. This is um, someone maintaining the grasslands in uh, the savannah. This is uh, a Madhu person uh, from Western Australia maintaining a grassland ecosystem. This is um, burning off of the forest in the boreal forest in Canada, maintaining a, another type of ecosystem. So the idea that we are uh, disturbing environments, and this is always uh, has a negative impact, we can actually disturb environments and bring about positive impacts that's building biodiversity and also building um, materials or habitat for us to exist within. So looking at um, this idea that there's knowledge, there's intrinsic knowledge in these environments and within these societies that we could actually um, look at to give us information about how we could exist within our societies. In the boreal forest, the Anishinaabe people um, look at the idea of using pyrotechnology in two different ways. They think that, uh, they call it ishkote, and that's the use of fire to maintain a grassland ecosystem. And it's very positive. It brings about new growth. It uh, provides habitat for animals. It provides a lot of materials for build housing, building houses, um, building mattresses, etc. And it, it's seen to happen in two different ways. One is naturally, and the other is um, man-lit. So the natural way, and there's all these myths and um, mythologies associated with how these actually occur. That's how memory and uh, the messages about how your environment is maintained are actually passed down. So the first way that the, um, the fires are actually started is called Binse Shkote. And that's by the thunderbird. So it's seen that the thunderbird comes down and from his eye he blinks and he creates th uh, lightning and that sets the ground on fire. And that's the way the ecosystems are maintained. When it's seen that people are doing it, they look for signals in their environments. And in the wetlands, um, I'm not going to try and pronounce that word, but this is the marshland spring burning of the, um, the grasslands. And the people look at the, to know when they actually should set fire to these marshes, is they look for when the color of the top of the lakes turns from, um, uh, from a from a muddy to a from a sort of um, from a white to a to a crystal when the actual ice begins to break and melt and that's when they actually set fire to all these environments. So there's all these environmental indicators that are showing people when they should actually start to maintain their environments. So what we're actually looking at, or what I'm interested in, is understanding how these coupled human nature systems, which are known as chans. Um, how they work and what we can learn from them and what we can learn from the folklore and the knowledge that's embedded um, within these e the, um, the uh, ecosystem dwellers' um, understanding of their environments. These coupled human nature systems are characterized by the fact, as I've said, ecological disturbance happens. There's sort of dynamic complexity. There's always um, changes occurring in the environments. There's adaptive management. So people are watching what's happening and they're adapting as different uh, circumstances occur. So they could deal with climate crisis because they have management systems to adapt when things go wrong or thing, things go beyond their thresholds. Um, they maintain sustainability through a symbiosis with uh, all different kinds of species. So every, every species in that environment is somehow understood as interacting with their process and they take advantage of that. And also, a lot of the coupled human nature systems, um, it's about cooperative self-governance. And we see that in the Subak, as uh, Steve was talking about the other day. So I'm going to give um, a couple of examples, and then move on to Bali. The Tofino uh, tribe, which are located in Benin, on Lake Nakuke, um, they use these amazing um, fish traps, which they make out of um, uh, kaja um, leaves, which are sort of like mangroves on the side of the lake, and they build these fish pens, and they've created a completely sustainable community based upon a, um, a, a completely sort of um, aquatic community based on this type of fishing and these uh, fish traps which they've, they've developed. 
So here's the lake here, and that's the actual village. The reason that they live in the water is because about 300 years ago, they were having warfare with another tribe, and the tribe that was chasing them uh, had a taboo about um, a demon that lived in the river. So this tribe ran into the river, ran into the lake, and they set up camp there, and they remained there, and they became a completely aquatic environment, um, a completely aquatic society. They'd previously been herders and grazers, so it's kind of interesting that now they're somewhat herding and grazing fish in their new environment. This is an image of their city. All these um, sort of lines throughout the, this, sort of, this is the shoreline up here, and there's all these lines moving into their actual village. They're um, canoe trails, so they travel, their form of transportation is canoe, and they're, all these fish pens are down here that are actually creating new territory and new land. Here's an image from above, a little bit pixelated. You can see all the um, houses and the fish playpen, uh, the fish pens in the background. And here they are actually constructing these um, fish pens. They bed these um, stalks and branches down into the ground. They form either a square or a spiral. They um, surround that by netting, and then they catch their fish. And there's a constant supply of fish coming into their netted environments, and they sell these at the surrounding markets. Um, so uh, with the research I've been doing, um, we've been looking through an architectural lens as at what is actually happening in these environments and looking at them as sort of infrastructural uh, interventions. So we're documenting um, using sort of the normal softwares of an architect, using CAD and 3D modeling, what these actual environments are that are being created. And so here you can see these branches being established, and then the, um, the, play, the pens are actually wrapped in a netting. The netting is um, of a size that small fish can actually swim in. They feed off algae that's growing on the rotting branches. Um, of the, uh, the sort of the mangrove branches, and then they grow so fat they actually can't move back out of the netting. So they're trapped in that space, and then they're easily fished. And the netting actually provides um, a barrier to any predators wanting to eat the fish. So they're actually creating a and maintaining a very safe environment that's really easy to harvest the fish. And here you can see um, one of these in sort of fish play pens fish pens under construction. One thing that I'm interested in is there's two types of morphologies of these pens. One's a spiral and one's a square. It seems that from observation of images, I haven't actually been to the site, um, and there's not much documented evidence um, about the actual infrastructure that's being created, but there's a spiral morphology, and that seems to occur closer to um, the, the mouths of, riv of rivers. And these square environments seem <coughs> to occur in less turbid waters. So one idea is that could this new aquaculture system be applied to aquaculture systems throughout the world, which are terribly polluting. They're reducing our mangrove populations by 50% in the last 20 years. Could we use these ideas to adapt um, failing systems and uh, innovations that we have um, in existence? And can we understand further as to are there other new adaptations to these types of systems that can conform contemporary pr practice? Um, one downside, though, to this system is that it's, such, it's been such a successful system that the Tofino are building more and more and more because they have more of a market demand for these fish. But what's occurring is there's now being um, deforestation of that mangrove system around the shoreline. So there is an issue now that this is where the village is, this is the extent of the water, and there are areas that are now actually deforested because of the demand for these fish. So there's still, it's not like these systems are they're sustainable, but they're not complete, completely successful. And a lot of cases, these ancient systems are beginning to break down. And moving to the Subak rice terraces, um, so these are, so we're located in Bali. We've, uh, a year ago, the Subak rice terraces were um, listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, but we've only captured um, 19,000 hectares of the Subak rice terraces. The terraces actually are all over the island. They're in green. 
Um, what we uh, what has been captured though is four different types of the most sort of um, pristine terraces that are still in existence. Uh, this is what they look like. This is in the shadow of, I believe, Manakum. Um, and these terraces sort of, sort of extend all the way throughout from the high elevations to the very low elevations. They've completely reformed and terraformed the entire island of Bali at the scale of watersheds. So they're a huge intervention into the landscape. And not only is it a surface intervention, tunnels which take water from um, the uh, upper ridges also honeycomb the island completely, moving water from um, upland areas down to the, where the subaks actually start. So the whole island of Bali has sort of completely been reformed through this intervention of um, the rice terraces. They're a sacred landscape because they're actually um, controlled by the Hindu priests and the water temples. Um, <coughs> But really what they are is they're actually one of the most biodiverse agrarian systems known to man. And they've been around for a thousand years and they are under threat um, from development, from tourism, and from uh, several different sources of pollution. So we're dealing with um, a complex system, but also a complex sort of set of uh, issues that are now compromising the existence of this um, ancient system. This is how they work. Um, they're ba basically like shallow pools. Uh, rice is planted, then it's flooded. There's different cycles that happen through the season. There's um, sort of uh, pipes that go between so the water can actually fall down and the gravity um, works to control this system and to accommodate this system. There's also weirs at the side that can actually be um, shut off or open to allow water into each of these um, rice fields. And at the top of every rice field is a shrine. So you can tell that this would be owned by one single farmer because it is a shrine at the top of that field. But it's not just this that this is a rice terror system. As I said, these couple of human nature systems, they're systems that are developed by humans, but they actually only exist because of the symbiosis that, and the understanding of the relationship with other species that has been um, used opportunistically to the advantage of the system. So there's all these different processes. This is showing five different phases. This does not happen all at the same time. Um, but these are five different phases throughout the year that are used to maintain um, the subak system. And there's uh, essential species that interact with this system from large birds to large mammals down to small algae um, and phytoplankton that actually make this system work. And it's not an understanding that the farmers have of all these different type of relationships, ecological relationships, but that there's an understanding that, the, that they're working symbiotically to maintain and exist within this, within this landscape. Uh, this is a seasonal cycle. Steve showed this the other day, showing all the different seasons and um, precipitation levels. And one thing that is so successful about this system is it's working with all the different seasons, it's working with precipitation, natural precipitation levels, um, and the whole rice calendar is based upon understanding when all the natural cycles occur, so there's no need for fertilizers, there's no need for pesticides, there's no need for any input into the system other than the how the actual natural system works, and that's what makes it sustainable for the last thousand years. Going back to the um, some of uh, the initial idea about conservation. Conservation and um, sacredness is often seen, and it's proven here, that it's preserving our eco-services and it's preserving ecology. So it's not that the mountain, uh, sorry, in Bali, the mountains are seen as the most sacred. The middle area, the plains, is sort of the zone where people live, and the sea is seen as sort of uh, the profane but not good and bad, just that these both things need to exist for one, each other to exist. So sacred cannot exist without profane, profane cannot exist without sacred. But the sacred is there to protect. And um, what the sacred is actually protecting is it's protecting it ecological services. In the mountains and in the volcanoes, they're not protected because they're beautiful. They're actually protected because they provide nutrients um, essential nutrients that allow the rice terraces and the plants to keep on growing and keep on evolving year after year after year. So if the mountains were protected, you might not get all the runoff 
that allows the rice terraces to keep on growing um, and keep on being fertilized every year. So the idea, what we're trying to do when we're designing in Bali is use these ideas, these co cosmological guidelines to guide the way that we're designing. Uh, so when we're looking at erosion strategies, we're thinking about how this Kaja and Kelad, um, which is one of these cosmological guidelines, can be used to establish where soil erosion, anti-soil erosion strategies can be placed. Or here we're looking at wetland systems and thinking about this Tribuana, which is a tripartite division of the mountains and the sea, how that can be used to think about wetland interventions and what type of wetland interventions occur where, where above ground, in the, just below the soil layer, or far further below ground as a detention basins. So we know that sacredness protects our ecological services, and we can see that when we do these sort of studies of elevation um, and looking at where uh, the relationships of sacredness to the landscape. And as I said before, all these different nutrients that we're getting, they're washed down through the monsoon rains and they're um, deposited into the rice terraces. And these are the processes that are actually being protected, even though it wasn't, uh, wasn't sort of aware that, yes, we're, we're um, protecting uh, decomposition and groundwater recharge. The idea was implicit that we had to protect to maintain uh, the ecological processes. So. In Bali, what we're doing um, as a means to protect this um, uh, ancient landscape is uh, we've designated two tourist routes. There's four different sites in yellow. And we're proposing that there is um, three eco-museums established along these two routes. People can go and actually learn about what this landscape is, what is a cultural landscape, and how all these systems work, which I've just explained to you. And the obvious way that um, we'll actually um, uh, get money to the, actual, to the farmers and to um, develop sort of, to get <coughs> finances to maintain a World Heritage Area is through these eco-museums, by charging people as they enter into these sites. <coughs> but there's a whole lot of other things that we have to deal with. Deal with. <coughs> and the idea within this um, form of design is that can we deal with as many large problems with an intervention for tourism as possible? Can we deal with issues of, in red, soil erosion? Um, in, these, in black, they're the, the sites, point pollution sites from hotels. There's a number of um, really devastating problems that are occurring. And if we can couple uh, conservation um, agendas with development agendas, then we'll have a much better chance of conserving these um, ancient cultural landscapes. So we've divided the whole site up into three different regions based upon the location of these eco-museums. But we also want to deal with the sort of um, pollution problems that are occurring there through conservation strategies. And we're looking at developing conservation strategies that are based on some of the innovative practices that have been documented and researched from other locations. So at one site, which is one of the eco-museums at the, the first regions, we're looking at developing a bamboo bicycle system, and that's uh, based upon the, France, the uh, Bike France system, but it's um, taking advantage of the fact that the Balinese are the most advanced bamboo bicycle builders that bamboo builders in the world, so we, can we attain a skill, can we get a skill set and can we use that in our new tourism strategy? The other idea is that we have these um, rice terraces. They're basically vertical wetland systems and as maybe you know, wetlands are a way to uh, purify polluted water. So can we intervene and put a modern technology such as, such as wetland intervention and water cleansing into these ancient terraces so that you're actually cleaning water and dealing with a pollution problem. In another region, I'm almost done, um, where there's an issue with erosion. So we're looking at um, can we uh, intervene and bring a technology um, that we use for anti-erosion and can we take some of the natural materials such as the coir matting which is prevalent and available everywhere in Bali can we build a new industry so that we actually give a new livelihood to the farmers and we bring added value to a landscape strategy to actually build upon a um, new economic and a new industry that will actually maintain and assist in landscape conservation. And uh, finally, we have an aquaculture system in one of the sacred lakes that's destroying and um, 
destroying sort of the environment and uh, bringing on high levels of pollution. So can we look at different aquaculture systems such as the Tofino and think about adapting the system um, that's actually in the sacred lakes of Bali to clean the water and bring upon a more sustainable type of innovation. And a lot of these strategies are also reciprocal. So one um, strategy will actually provide material and um, labor for another one of these uh, livelihood strategies. Um, I'll skip through this, but we're actually looking at, um, as one of the designs, taking um, uh, these models of innovation to highlight in these eco museums what the ecology is and what the sacredness is and how can you as a designer um, highlight these relationships. I'll just skip through this and actually get to the end. But the most important thing is that um, this is a cultural landscape. There are people that exist in there and we want to maintain the environment for these people. So it's a completely participatory process. Right now we're at this moment where they're just designing and giving ideas and we're going to go through a process of community participation and consultation that will be rigorous so that the, the ideas can be filtered and will be told actually what the people in the UNESCO World Heritage Site would actually like to see and how they would like to maintain their environments. And finally, um, this innovation um, that is being developed now with an ex-Apple technology group guy and a group of um, pretty dedicated volunteers that are all around the world is that we're um, building, we're designing a new um, e interactive ebook so that we'll actually take the designs and um, to the people and they'll be actually I'll be able to comment on what they think of the designs. The problem with doing um, part participatory uh, design processes in a rural location on the other side of the world is you can't always be there. And every time there's a design development that happens, you can't um, document it and respond immediately. But with an interactive ebook, we're thinking it actually might change the way that designs can develop um, in a cultural landscape so that um, the people who are living there will actually, if we give them a design, they'll actually be able to interact and tell us how to adapt it and the, the design will almost uh, evolve itself. So I think I'm out of time, but uh, that's the end. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, questions? Yeah, please. Beautiful picture, isn't it? Yeah. So the, a question I would have is: the Steve was telling us that um, you know these subaks they de deteriorate if you don't attend to them like two weeks, two I think you said two, two weeks, right? Yeah, a couple of weeks, and these things have been stable for thousands of years. So from complexity theory point of view, that means that there are um, uh, many different levels of stability in the system. Um, but they are, uh, you know, let's say, very dangerous, very difficult to maintain. So if, if you just, you know, small changes will, will have dramatic effects if, if things are deteriorating in two weeks. Okay, so the question I would have is uh, how, I, I would be terrified doing anything there, just let, apart from looking. <laughs> so, because, you know, if things fall apart in two weeks, things have been stable for a thousand years, uh, there is something very, very special happening there. So, so uh, how are you going to deal with that? How, if you make your policy, what you call, what did you call it, cosmological guidelines, mm -hmm. um, how are you going to take these things into account? I just, I will well, be terrified. I think that no matter what, there, uh, there is development that's <coughs> going to happen. It's actually happening already without any sort of um, guidance at all. And there's destruction happening. So there is an acceptance that development is going to happen. What's happening now is not preferred, so there has to be some type of intervention, better uh, good intervention than a bad intervention. And so there is also the idea that at all of these eco museums there would be pilot projects, so there would be a testing. At one of the museums is actually a water management training centre, so we'll couple onto that um, infrastructure to try and test out, for example, I think you might be referring to the wetlands, putting wetlands into a rice terrace. Um, even the logistics of uh, where the wetlands would actually occur in the rice terraces in response to what areas are sacred. There's small areas that are sacred in um, each of the um, uh, terraces. So that would have to be worked out. But I think there's a lot of 
uh, sort of technical as well as anthropological and cultural issues that have to be developed and really worked through. That's why we have Steve Lansing, <laughs> which is um, a wonderful thing to work with an anthropologist being an architect. But so, so, yeah. so, but, but the thing is, I, I think that what I really do not understand, I mean, if things are so feeble, if they're so easy falling apart, um, and then from a distance or whatever, you, you, you design something and, um, you know, it, you just turn your back on it and it, it might disappear. So, <coughs> so actually the question would be how resilient is the system? Then once it falls apart, can it, can it recover? Um, or, you know, once it falls apart, it's gone. That, that, that would determine your frequency of monitoring uh, what, what the impact is of any action that you're taking. Yeah, I think also, though, the idea is that we would give these ideas to the farmers and they would, we would sort of teach them uh, after doing... Uh, are you teaching them or are they teaching you? Because no, that's they're what are the ones... I think we would say, okay, this is an idea. You can use wetland uh, restoration and water harvesting to clean the water that's coming through your system that's really polluted and that has uh, fertilizers and phosphates in it. Can you use this as, and can you start to evolve it and integrate it into your system? So that there's reciprocity, it's an idea, and then it becomes tested, and then it, it could be you know, developed further. It could actually not be developed at all. But to give the idea and to o open up the discussion is, I think, the primary ambition and to be able to do some of the research to understand if the actu if the system actually works. Okay. Douglas. Yeah, I spent about uh, six weeks in Bali in the mid 80s and it was just incredible. I saw some of this and I'm just delighted to be more enlightened about how it works. One of the things that struck me was the culture that these practices are embedded in. Mm -hmm. And in Bali, like if you look at Bali paintings, they are very dense. All the space is filled up with people, gods, animals, or plants. There's nothing left over. So in the culture, they're dealing with complexity and interaction at a very, very high level. And one thing that was just symbolically interesting to me was uh, at least then there were lots of little ugly dogs all over everywhere. And I finally asked an older Balinese, what about these dogs? Everything is so beautiful. Why do you have them? And he said, look, ugliness is also real. And if you don't honor it, it will come back and get you some other way. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a remarkable statement that, in a way, fits into the culture that you're describing in a way I'm seeing for the first time. Mm -hmm. OK. Other questions? In the back? <coughs> Julia, thanks very much. I, I want to go back to a question that I asked Steve yesterday morning, which is, how do you, and hopefully I'll do it a little more articulately now, how do you take the sort of methodologies that you're applying to help, uh, help in this context develop some of the experiments that you need to try, but where you have a legacy of a thousand years where the time scale, I imagine when they first tried to set up these systems, there, were there was lots of trial and error and failures, but the time scale over which they learned and evolved was decades to hundreds of years. So the, the depth of complexity that Doug just described, mm -hmm. the level of balance that they've achieved, is not something that was a decadal time scale or a five-year time scale. And yet, when we're trying to translate these sorts of methods and this sort of thinking into the architectural design of suburban Bombay or, or uh, here in Singapore, or take, take, your, take your pick of where, where the large cities and the fast time scale of evolution, how do you wrestle with that challenge when you go from something where the time scales are incredibly long to suddenly highly compressed and there's not as much time for the social learning, the social dynamics to change, the cultural norms, the religious aspects to develop around, uh, around the learning and it's much, more, uh, it, it's much more reliant on new media technologies or new mm -hmm. so forms of social interaction that we don't have yet. I think, I mean, I think Steve's answer may have been somewhat the same, I can't remember his answer, but there has to be something done, it has to be done very quickly. I mean, in the last year that we've been working on the site, since it's actually um, become a UNESCO World Heritage Area, there's been several articles in newspapers saying this site is being destroyed. So the time scale that there has to be a response is immediate. And if there's not the sort of longevity and build up of um, experience and uh, uh, the synthesis, the, the process being streamlined that happened over that last thousand years to make, to bring it into existence, then you just don't have that period of time.
but also um, researching indigenous and traditional peoples and the way they understand that in their environments, the idea of adaptive management, which is not really the way that we work, that you adapt immediately to different circumstances. So if there was, um, like in one of the lectures yesterday, if there was a flood level that went so high that it stopped all the industrial production in a particular area, if that was to happen, then the next year there would be an immediate adaptation, people would move beyond that flood line. So there's a very, very quick response embedded within the system of learning and the way that knowledge is passed through, but also um, a quick story. Um, there was an uh, Aboriginal community that I researched many, many years ago um, in the Northern Territory in Australia, and they had an area called a dangerous place. And it was a dangerous place because if you went there, you would actually get ants in your body and you would become sick. That was the story. What uh, that had happened sort of, um, it, and it was, a, it was apparently had always happened, but two years before, there had been some testing um, there and it was deemed that it wasn't acceptable because of sort of nuclear uh, radiation that you couldn't go to that area. So in two years, a story had been created that was embedded as long um, ancient knowledge that had sort of happened in a very brief period of time. So the idea of understanding and the, w the response system to um, some kind of threat occurs very quickly. That's a really simple response, but there's a completely different understanding of time and the way environments and relationships work that I think, um, I, I don't think that there would need to be that really extended period of time. I think that we could actually figure it out quite quickly given the knowledge base that, base that already exists. Okay. That's it. Well, thank you once again. Thank you.